From Olympic City and the home of Pikes Peak, this is the Automotive ADHD Show. Yeah, here we are rocking it on the Automotive ADHD Show. Heard around the world as a podcast. And right here in Southern Colorado on the radio, my name is Matt West. I am here to talk about cars. Hopefully, you are here to listen to talk about cars. Uh, That's what this show's about. It's a lot of fun. I've got a whole lot of stories Fun stuff in the works for you. A loaded show as usual. Oh, and before before I even get to, to those topics, um, next week I've got a really exciting guest uh, coming on to talk about um, mental health in cars. Super, it's going to be a really good show, and I can't wait to talk to him. His name is Sean. He is a mental health advocate, and he is an Army veteran, Army combat veteran specifically. So I'm uh, going to be talking to him. That's going to be really cool. you got to stay tuned for next week's show. Now for today, I'm going to talk about the Ford F-150 Raptor R and how it makes it, it's finally making its way to journalists. And uh, yes, it's a 700-horsepower V8 Raptor. And it is every bit as cool as that sounds. Also, in other news, climate activists make their way to a Porsche museum. And it didn't go all that well for the climate activists. <laughs> it's kind of funny, actually. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, Tesla and how they're up to their usual skullduggery when it comes to um, berating owners for doing things. Uh, GM has a weird recall fix that normally i don't talk about these little recalls on the show but the fix for this one's so stupid it's kind of funny so we're going to get to that and we're going to talk about the meaning of friendship and volvo 240s or one or the other so something something along those lines but you know it's going to be good Uh, of course you have tuned into the correct car show now before we get to that i said i was going to talk about this every week until it gets passed but and, and i am i am if you love cars You should love the RPM Act. The RPM Act is our last defense against the EPA, who wants to take away your ability to turn street cars into competition-only race cars, and in doing so, they are going to completely decimate grassroots motorsports. And uh, this is important even if you don't race. You might say, I'm I'm, I'm not a track guy. I just got wheels and a high-flow cat, or I got a cat-back exhaust, whatever. Um, This matters for you because if the small companies, the American small businesses that make a lot of these parts, that do a lot of these things, they get their money through grassroots motorsports. They make speed parts. And in in doing so, they can afford to then make also street legal parts. If if they can't do racing, they can't stay in business and uh, they can't get you your cat back exhausts your wheels, your stuff like that. So this is really important. Um, this doesn't affect F1 or NASCAR. They have multi-billion dollar budgets. No, nope, they're not the target of the EPA. Who is the target? You and me. Your grassroots guys working on cars, your enthusiasts who want to make their cars just a little bit better and also take them to the track. Uh, that's who this affects. And um, so what you, what you can do, it's not doom and gloom. We can fight back. I know we can. We're going to be successful. Check out SaveOurRaceCars.com. Again, that is SaveOurRaceCars.com. When you go there, you uh, have the ability to create a letter, and it's within a couple clicks. You don't even have to worry about writing it or anything, and it'll automatically send that letter to your congressional Uh, representatives and your other state representatives who are involved with this. So let them know what you think about it. Um, The only way they know is by you telling them. Believe it or not, this is pretty far off the radar of most representatives. So we have to tell them. Um, By the way, listener Logan messaged me on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash automotive ADHD, just earlier this month. And Logan said that he went through saveourracecars.com, sent a message to one of his state representatives, uh, specifically Sherrod Brown, and they got back to him and thanked him for his uh, his thoughts on that. So, yes, we can win this. We can do it. SaveOurRaceCars.com. Now, anyway, uh, let's get on with a couple of fun things here. It's been a beautiful week here in Colorado. Halloween was beautiful. We did have a storm Thursday that left snow on Pikes Peak, um, probably for the first time all season, except for that one time during the Pikes Peak Hill Climb that I was up there and it snowed, and it was really cold. But aside from that, we haven't seen snow really on the peak, um, so that's really, really good. But in other news, 
I don't always talk about my own project cars because that's not what this show is about. But this is this is a fun story. Um, friend of the show uh, and occasional guest on the show, OBD1 Kenobi, otherwise known as Brian. He is a Volvo guy, by the way. He's a Volvo technician, and he's also a Volvo junkie. <laughs> he's had a lot of them. He loves them. Uh, well, this particular Volvo 240 came up, and he said, hey, you should buy this 240. And I go, I don't know. I don't know. He's like, you should buy this 240. Okay, maybe I'll buy this 240. No, you should buy this 240. Okay, fine, I'll buy this 240. And then it ended up in my trailer and came home with me. And um, it, no, and to answer your first questions, no, it does not run. No, it's not registered. And there's no way it passes emissions. But they, you know what they say, though, right? 87% of Volvo owners are college educated. And there's, I, I'm definitely not using 87% of my degree in buy, <laughs> buying it. I'll tell you that. Also, when you see the average uh, Volvo owner, um, yeah, the first owner might be, uh, you know, a sophisticated businessman. But I tell you what, the, the second owners know how to have fun with their cars. They beat them up. They have fun with them. They do all sorts of, they put moose horns on them. Volvo people are a whole nother breed. I'll tell you that. And uh, Brian, OBD1 Kenobi, I'm going to have him on the show here pretty soon. He, it's been a while since he's been on. Uh, but he is an enabler. He is, he is what you call an enabler. Now he has been, since I got the car, he's been sending me links endlessly to different Volvo Facebook pages, and I've been going through them. And um, so far, my favorite one is called, called uh, quote, Crackheads That Own Volvos. And it is exactly what you think. <laughs> it is hilarious. So, so far, that's my favorite page. Um, I've been going through that. I guess, uh, can I say I'm, I, I'm, uh, I, 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 I'm not even, <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. It's a lot of fun, though. Um, and um, yeah, Volvo 240. What's the plan for the car? I don't know. I bought it. I don't know what to do with it yet. Do you think I do you think I truly consider these things when I'm buying a car like what I'm going to do with it? No, no, it's, it's don't worry buy it worry about that later. So, anyway, uh I do have a car with a Volvo engine in it, but that's a swap. So this I guess I can officially say I've joined the weird moose gang um with a Volvo 240 and uh I guess I'm proud to do so. So there you go. Lots of fun. That's a true friend by the way. Like some of my other friends, you know, who Maybe aren't as into cars as I am. Like, yeah, I bought this other car. They go, oh my God, not again. Why? Why do you need it? I can't tell you why I need it. I just know I bought it. Uh, I don't, you know, again, one question at a time. But Brian goes, no, buy it, buy it, buy it, do it, do it. You know, like in cartoons, how they have the little devil and the angel on someone's shoulder. Angel saying, no, don't buy the car. Think about the the maintenance costs. Think about, it's got to, it doesn't run. And then the devil is Brian. And he's sitting there with a little pitchfork going, do it, do it, buy it buy it. You won't regret it. It doesn't matter. It's a Volvo. <laughs> Just buy it. So anyway, he's probably laughing because he's listening to this right now. But anyway, so there you go. I guess I'm I'm joining the club with old Volvos. Um, the 240, by the way, uh, it's like if you asked a five-year-old to draw a car, like an outline, a side profile of a car, they draw a Volvo 240. And, and, and in fact, every five-year-old who's driven a, or drawn a car, rather not driven a car, who's drawn a car has actually been drawing a Volvo 240 because even as five-year-olds, they know that those are just the superior cars. So um, they forget that as they get older. It's, uh, it's brainwashed out of them. But even as children, they know that Volvo 240 is superior. So and that's why they draw them. Uh, but anyway, it's something we have to relearn as adults. <laughs> so now I digress. Uh, let me get to this here. Really cool thing going on that I'm excited about. Check this out. Hot Rod Magazine is going to post every single issue that they've had from 1948 to 2021. This is cool. I love this. Um, over 128,000 pages of Hot Rod Magazine have been digitized with thousands of photos and articles um, for like 70 years or more. So uh, this is super cool. Um, and, um, and what's neat is it's going to be on the internet. It's going to be digitized. We can all access it. And they're not necessarily putting it behind a paywall. Now, Hot Rod Magazine is in conjunction with Motor Trend. Um, and, uh, and and so you do have to have a Motor Trend account. That's the only that's the only thing you do. You do have to have that. But otherwise, to existing Motor Trend subscribers um, and uh, to existing subscribers, all 128,000 pages of the magazine are going to be available without any additional cost. So that's really cool. I think uh, I'm going to spend a huge amount of time, an unreasonably large amount of time browsing through that because 
How cool is that? Not only if you're a fan of cars. Yes, there's going to be, uh, you can go through the magazines and chronicle the technological progression of the automobile because uh, uh, Hot Rod has been there covering it for much of the existence of the car, really. Um, not only can you do that, but you can see uh, the evolution of engineering, the evolution of motorsports and hot rodding and DIY stuff. Stuff, by the way, that the RPM Act protects, just uh, throwing that in there again. Uh, but you can go through that. You can check it all out. And then even if, say you're not even that big of a fan of cars, I mean, I don't know anyone who wouldn't, who wouldn't be that big of a fan of cars, but even if you're not, you're just a fan of history, um, it's super cool looking through that and seeing all the historical, the ads and the, all, like everything, the magazines are there in their entirety. So all the old school ads are there for different things. I think that is just super cool. Um, so uh, definitely a good reason uh, not a not a shill. I'm I'm not shilling out to Motor Trend. I'm not paid to say it, but that's a <laughs> that's a really compelling reason to get an account on their website uh, and subscribe to it because that's just super cool. Uh, you know, I I already am. So uh, anyway, cool stuff. That's going to go live uh, this week, by the way. So uh, very cool. Uh, another quick thing uh, I I want to touch on here uh, is, and this is just silly. We won't spend a lot of time on it because generally speaking, recalls aren't that interesting. Uh, in fact, I did not talk about this recall when it happened because I was like, eh, it's not worth talking about. But but the fix now is hilarious, so I am going to talk about it. Uh, the recall involves 2010 to 2017 GMC Terrains, a pretty boring car. I'm not, you know, throwing shade at anyone who owns one, but anyone who owns one also knows that that's just a, yeah, it's a boring car, okay? Um, Again, another reason why I wasn't going to talk about this. Oh, it's a recall, a boring recall about a boring car. But no, the fix is entertaining. So the recall relates to the headlights. And the headlights have an issue, which is that when they are on the low beams, because of the design of the headlight housing, some light reflects up into the high beam reflector and then shoots up into the sky. Owners were reporting that when they're driving through like back roads where there's trees, they would actually see a beam of light going way up into the trees, which is a little weird. Um, well, the federal motor vehicle safety standards uh, that all headlights and manufacturers have to comply with uh, don't allow for that. So even though the headlights weren't actually defective in a way that would point that light in other drivers, it's important to have headlights um, and standards for them so we don't blind other drivers. Um, the guys, the, the bro dozer guys with their squatted pickup trucks with the 16,000 light bars driving through the middle of the city at the night definitely um, are the reason we have headlight standards. I will say that. Um, but the headlight standards here don't allow for this. Even though the light wasn't, you know, blinding other drivers, they say, nope, it's not in the regs. Fix it. GM tried to appeal, saying that it really isn't that big of an issue. And the government said, nope, fix it. So GM's fix is probably the, like, laziest fix you could ever imagine. But it's kind of funny because... It's a 12-minute repair. They uh, tell, according to their um, what they give their uh, technicians, it's a 12-minute repair, uh, which you know the technician's really going to do it in like a minute and still bill 12 minutes for it. But, but that being said, it's a sticker. It's like a piece of tape. It's a it's an opaque kind of diamond-shaped piece of tape that is stuck to the front of the headlight, and it just blocks that section that reflects. That's it. Like that. That's all. Like. All they do is put a sticker on it and it, boom, there's your fix. And you know, an engineer came up with this solution because you could say, well, we could redesign the headlight housings and we could fix this, or we could black this out inside the housing and take the housing. Nope. Nope. Put a sticker on the outside. Very pragmatic, very straight to the point solution. Very much of an engineer, I would say, because an engineer would say, okay, there's light getting out here. So let's just make light not get out here. Boom, sticker, done. <laughs> and when you think about it, it is kind of brilliant though, right? Because you have uh, recalls and bear in mind, dealerships and technicians don't really get paid for recall work in the way you would expect them to. They're not making any money on this. They're, they're The manufacturer is legally mandated to provide this fix and the rate that technicians get paid. I hear a lot of technicians who gripe, ah, I spent all day doing recalls and it sucked. Um, so... What you have is a quick fix. It's cheap. It's a it's a sticker. It's a it's a it's just a cutout that you put on there. I mean, it's almost just a piece of tape, honestly, and you stick it on there, and um, and it doesn't take the technician's time. It doesn't cost really much to make. It's probably a couple cents, and boom, recall done. Get out. Don't worry about it. 
now, obviously, um, owners of GMC terrains aren't very happy about it because it's not a very aesthetic fix. It's not. Um, if I was an owner of a GMC terrain, um, I don't know if I would like it very much. But then again, you know, if I was an owner of a GMC terrain, this would be the most exciting thing that would have happened to me with that GMC terrain. Uh, honestly, it would be a, a, a welcomed bit of excitement uh, because if you're a GMC terrain owner, nothing else is exciting about that car whatsoever. So actually getting a recall and getting a funny looking little sticker put on the front of your headlights, was pre that's pretty exciting if you're comparing that to the baseline of literally zero interesting things whatsoever. So I think that owner should actually embrace this change and embrace some of the excitement of, yes, I got to take my car to the dealer and it's not because it was broken for once. So, <laughs> oh my God, any GMC terrain owners just tuned out. Then again, they probably weren't listening in the first place because their cars are, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those cars. They're just, they're just not, in, I don't know. They're, they're whatever. It's a car. It gets you there. And now it's got a funny sticker on the headlights. So uh, you could also like, it made me think too, like GM put a kind of a frosted opaque, you know, semi translucent sticker there to cover up that spot. But I was thinking you could put other things there too. You could put like a smiley face. You could put a, uh, like a good thumbs up sticker, you know, I mean the, the, it's up to you, honestly. You know, again, GMC terrain owners don't have much interesting things happen with their cars. So might as well get creative here. Go to like, you know, your third grade teacher's sticker book and go just plaster up that one spot on the headlight. Don't plaster the rest of it because then you'll block the light. Too much of it, but that, that one spot. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, there you go. There you go. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Now, hey, coming up here in the next segment of the show uh, is... It's something that I think is hilarious, it's odd, a bunch of climate protesters went to the Porsche Museum and things didn't turn out for them as they expected. I'll talk about that here coming up in just a minute. At the Speed Council, getting things done fast is our priority. We do everything fast, from driving, working, sleeping, and eating. Someone help, he's choking! This is Tim. Hello. And by the time this ad is over, he'll have bicycled across the earth 69 times. Nice. Even if our name sounds unfamiliar, you know our work. F1? Pfft, child's play. The world's first supersonic jet? Yep, that was us. F1. Apollo 11? Also us. The fastest animal in the sea? Hell, we even wrote the Wikipedia article. Fast. And we're so dedicated to speed that we've genetically engineered the world's first hyperspeed speed machine. With this scientific breakthrough, you can download your favorite automotive podcast a whole day early. How's that for fast? Patreon.com slash Throttle Warrior. Donate now. Download the show early and receive special perks. This message approved by the Speed Council and the Church of Fast Things. Oh yeah, there we go. Those car sounds... We're sent in by Lucas. That is his 2JZ swapped RX-8. That one's from the vault. You heard it before. I decided I wanted to play it again just because it is that cool. Uh, the uh, RX-8, it's a great chassis. Um, if anything, burdened by some of the reliability problems of the factory rotary engine, even though the rotary is seriously cool. But a lot of owners don't want to deal with that. A 2J, that's a good swap. That's a lot of fun. There's a lot of potential in that type of motor, and uh, it's really fun. So I do want to thank Lucas for sending those car sounds in. If you would also like to send your car sounds in, I can only encourage you to do it. If if anything, for a selfish reason, because it brings me entertainment and joy, but you know, it, it's a lot of fun, and I love being able to share your car sounds right here on the show, and you get to say your car sounds were not only on the podcast, but on the radio. You can tell your friends to listen. It's a lot of fun. And of course, you're compensated for your time in doing so because you are entered for a chance to win a $25 parts store gift certificate, the automotive ADHD keychain. I got a bunch more of those in stock now and the automotive ADHD sticker. So it is cool. It is totally worth your time. I do the drawing for that every month and I pull one winner out of all the car sounds I get every month. Now, you might, keen listeners might notice this is about the time of month I the, of the month I should be doing a drawing. I'm going to postpone it to next week's show. Purely for some logistical reasons, but I'm going to postpone that. It's going to be good. And so uh, listen next week to not only my interview with um, uh, with an army veteran who's now a mental health 
uh, advocate, and he uses cars to help promote mental health. It's really cool. It's really cool. Not only that, you'll get to hear who also wins the Car Sound of the Month giveaway, but you should definitely stay tuned for my interview with uh, Sean, by the way. So uh, that's going to be really exciting again coming up next week. So next thing I want to talk about here, and this is a good one. This is, this is, okay, this is hilarious in a sort of weird and twisted way, but it is, it is funny. So, um, a bunch of climate activists have been going around Europe, uh, protesting, uh, I guess they're protesting oil among other things. I guess they're honestly protesting everything to me, but I guess they're focused on oil for this specifically. Um, and some of my European listeners may also actually be familiar with these guys because they've gone around, uh, they're the same people who are responsible for uh, pouring tomato soup on priceless works of art. Uh, they're not limited to tomato soup. They've also thrown mashed potatoes at works of art as well in art exhibits uh, and then glued themselves to the wall, glued their hands to the walls. Um, rather strange way to protest. But they have now turned their attention to the Porsche Museum within the VW facility in um, uh, the Wolfsburg factory complex um, for Volkswagen and, uh, in the, in the complex, they've got a Porsche museum and they've got a lot of cool cars there. And so the climate activists, uh, went into the museum, all decided to sit around a very particular Porsche 911 GT3. Um, maybe they're more of a, a Porsche Boxster type of person. You know, they don't like the 911. They can, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. They just picked that car, I guess. Um, and then they all sat down and glued their hands, this time to the floor, getting a little more creative. Last time they glued their hands to the wall, this time they glued their hands to the floor. And what the protesters are used, so this is good though where this ends up, because what the protesters are used to happening is the media shows up, they take pictures of them, they take video of them, and they get a bunch of attention essentially for free, they get a bunch of free publicity, uh, and they get to feel important in the cause they are going behind. I don't agree with the cause they're behind, but they at least get to feel important with it. And um, But that didn't happen this time. That didn't happen, no. Because instead of giving them the attention that they desired so badly, the staff of the museum, all they did was they left them there through the business hours. They just let, they just let them be. Just sat them there. Okay, they're not, they're not damaging the cars. Just let them be there. And then closing time came around. And the staff looked around, turned off the lights, closed the door, and left the protesters in the museum, only having periodic checks by the security guards at night to make sure the protesters weren't ransacking the cars. And, um, so they just left them in there. Yep. They're like, okay, well, uh, we're just gonna, just gonna leave. That's, that's all we're going to do. Just going to close up for the day, completely ignoring the protesters, um, who then, and this is, this is what's amazing, who then had the gall to complain that the Porsche museum staff were not providing for their needs. Bear in mind at this point, they are trespassers. They're trespassing. And the muse they claim, though, that the museum staff didn't provide them receptacles to go to the bathroom with, you do with that what you will, um, or food. So why, why exactly is it the museum staff's responsibility to provide protesters with things for, to, to eat and places to do their, it's, it's, that's not their job. So they complained about that. And then they complained about the startling uh, use of flashlights by the security guards who came in at night to check on them and make sure that presumably that they were still breathing and that they weren't damaging the cars. And they were startled by that. And that was a problem. And you know what? You know what? I, again, I won't get political with my argument here, but the fact is all of this could be they, they complained about this poor treatment from the staff. They complained about being ignored. Uh, one of them actually had to go to the hospital because of how he glued his hand to the floor, um, caused, I guess he was an older guy among the group, uh, caused an issue where he was, I guess, at risk for blood clotting and that became a medical emergency. So he had to leave and go to the hospital. But when you think about it, all of their complaints, everything could have been avoided had they just not glued their hands to the floor or been and trespassing and protesting to begin with because what happened next is the museum staff just closed up shop left for the day and then came back the next morning uh where all the protesters were very upset and uh, then the police came and arrested the protesters which was not the outcome they were expecting again these protesters are really used to um everyone listening to them and videotaping them and 
They're not used to just being ignored and then subsequently arrested for trespassing. Um, and uh, the fact that they picked the Porsche uh, Museum to do it in, at least they didn't do something as reprehensible as, you know, what they did to some priceless works of art. Um, at least they didn't like pour tomato soup on a, you know, Porsche 959 interior or something, um, you know. But still, it's uh, at least they didn't damage the cars. No cars were harmed. None of the protesters had any lasting injuries. If any that they had, they were self-inflicted from also gluing their hands to the floor, uh, which is not really a wise thing to do. And all of this could have been avoided, again, if they just didn't glue their hands to the floor and maybe protested outside on a public sidewalk without trespassing. So then they also wouldn't have been charged with trespassing. You know, there, there, there are legal ways to go about protesting, but <laughs> these guys didn't do it. And um, another side note here, if 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 you will allow me to say, um, isn't super glue and a number of adhesives, aren't them aren't those petroleum based? So they used probably petroleum based glue to glue their hands to the floor, yet they're protesting petroleum. That doesn't make a lot of sense. I, you think they would use something more like eco-friendly glue wise, like, I don't know, Elmer's school glue, you know, or, you know, you think they would use that. Um, and do you remember, by the way, if you were like any time in school, do you remember the one kid in the classroom who always used to drink the glue? Just a side note, <laughs> just a side note. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I, I remember that distinctly as a child. Uh, but uh, I remember kids would drink the glue, which is why that glue's like, you know, safe, right? That's why they use it around children. Perhaps that's the glue these people should have used. Um, because it's not petroleum based, uh, but by using super glue, uh, I do think they are violating their anti-petroleum uh, doctrine, their rules that they set for themselves. So they might they might want to reconsider um, that as well. That's like somebody protesting milk by drinking milk. That doesn't make a lot of sense, in my opinion. So um, anyway, there you go. They protested at the Porsche Museum, and the museum staff, uh, rightfully so in my opinion, ignored them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so there you go. At least these people were steadfast in their convictions, though I disagree with their convictions. At least they stayed true to them. And I don't want to give them any credit and I won't give them credit for that either. But there you go. So what what can you do? What can you do? Um, thankfully, the climate protesting here in the United States at the moment has generally been limited to the tire deflator people. You may have heard about them. They've been going around for about a year um, deflating people's tires, not slashing people's tires, which would be pretty rude. Uh, it's still rude to deflate the tires, but, uh, albeit less, less destructive. Um, that's about the extent that I have witnessed at least. So, um, anyway, there, there you go with that. And, uh, now here's something the climate protesters might not like very much. Um, and this is a great segue. The Ford Raptor R. Yes. The Ford Raptor R has, uh, finally made its way to journalists. Um, now, Ford had a big media event with dozens of new V8 beasts, and they let the journalists drive them willy-nilly through the desert, sliding them around, jumping them, drifting them, doing all sorts of fun things. Car and Driver was there. The Drive was there. Jalopnik was there, and many others. Uh, most notably absent, though, was um, the Automotive ADHD show. Ford, I didn't get the invite. I feel... Uh, I feel left out. I feel offended that I didn't, I was not invited to the party, which involved jumping and sliding V8 Raptors through the desert. That sounds like a whole lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, if you think this particular talk show host uh, should be nominated to go there and then talk about it on this show, um, <laughs> maybe complain to Ford. Uh, and then maybe I could bring some listeners along too. And then everyone can have fun in V8 Raptors because that would be a great time. I would really love that. Now, the V8 Raptor though, the Raptor originally started out. Rap the Raptor, obviously, you know, is is Ford's high performance off road F one fifty. It's got long travel suspension. It's it's particularly adept at going fast off road. Uh, when you want to go rock crawling, you don't usually use a Raptor. When you want to bomb through the desert at hundred miles an hour, that's what you use a Raptor for. And um, a buddy of mine owned a Ford Raptor uh, for a while, and uh, I had the fortune to drive it several times enthusiastically off road. And it was the um, uh, EcoBoost Raptor. But regardless, it was a lot of fun. I, I don't think I've ever driven a car that is that smooth and comfortable when you're going through really aggressive, whoopy, you know, off-road terrain. The Raptor is very good at that. I will say that. I will say that. It, it, 
most notably, it was lacking a V8 sound, but that that uh, turbo six cylinder was absolutely it was uh, was no slouch. So I liked that, but a V8 would be better. The Raptor originally started with a V8, and then they went to the the six cylinder. Now they're going back to a V8. Now you can still buy the six cylinder version, but the Raptor R is the V8 one, and it is exciting. It's got 700 horsepower. Um, it's got a base price of $109,000, which is considerable. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, 700 horsepower at 6,600 RPM and 640 pound-feet of torque at 4,200 RPM. Very nice. I like that. Uh, 0 to 60, 3.7 seconds, 100 miles an hour in 9.5 seconds, 114 mile an hour top speed, presumably a le- electronically limited. Uh, but then again, I really wouldn't want to do much more than that in a pickup truck. Uh, here's the thing, though. It directly competes with Dodge. You have the Ram TRX, the T-Rex, as you could say, but TRX. Uh, and I love, I do love how Ram takes not so subtle, or not Ram, but Dodge as a whole Mopar takes not so subtle jabs at their competitors. The Ford Raptor really created a whole segment um, in a market that in the market that didn't exist. The fast, fun, off-road, Baja style kind of factory pre-runner pickup truck. Now, granted, it's nothing like an actual uh, trophy truck. Those are definitely different. It's still more of a production truck, but still fast, powerful, fun off-road. Um, and, and so Ford really capitalized on that for years, and they called it the Raptor, which is a cool name. And then Ford makes the T-Rex because what's bigger than the T-Rex or than the Raptor is a T-Rex, obviously. Uh, but now we have the Raptor R, which is definitely a competitor to the T-Rex. The T-Rex, though, does make more power. Two whole powers more. <laughs> Two whole horsepowers. 702 horsepower. Um, and uh, it's got a very similar zero to 60 time. It's also very similar in gas mileage because it gets 10 miles to the gallon. That's nice, isn't it? Um, here's the thing, though. Um, the Ram and the Raptor are similarly performance wise. They're similar performance wise. That two horsepower is irrelevant. Uh, torque wise, horsepower wise, they are the same truck where this is interesting to me though, is in terms of the price. So the price on the Raptor R $109,000, um, the price on the TRX is $80,000. That's a big difference. That is a substantial difference. We're not talking the difference between 80,000 and 90,000. Uh, no, we're talking a lot more than that. And I think that makes that a tough sell. It really does because the, the, the Raptor for all practical purposes is the same. Uh, now no one's had them really side by side off road. Obviously Ford engineers have, cause they were using that as a, as a baseline to build against, but um, I haven't seen any independent reviews that have had them side by side. If you look at them on paper, at least the Raptor and the TRX are equally matched. Yet the Raptor is, is a lot more expensive, like substantially more expensive. Um, which is, uh, that can be, I mean, maybe you're getting more truck. I really don't think you are though. Um, and, uh, I don't know. That's a hard, that's a hard one to justify. Um, but regardless, I mean, no matter what you choose to buy, obviously someone like myself, um, is <laughs> especially people who drive old Volvo two forties usually aren't in the market of buying hundred thousand dollar supercharged pickup trucks. But if you are, I guess what my official recommendation would be is buy them both simple solution, right? Um, if you can't decide which one to get, just buy them both. I mean, it's easy, right? When you think about it that way, everything becomes easy. But I mean, really, if you're the sort of person, um, you know, and some people say, why do these trucks need to exist? No one's going to buy them. The few people that are going to buy them aren't going to use them off road. They're just going to go to the mall with them. It doesn't matter. They're stupid. Now, I disagree because if you are the sort of person who has both too much money and too much fuel, um, that you need a solution uniquely capable of of burning all of that fuel. Now, obviously you could buy the TRX for $80,000 and then that money you saved over the Raptor, you could spend that on fuel. But, you know, say if you really are that person, you've got, you've got too much cash, you've got too much fuel. You say, oh no, what do I do? What do I buy? You could buy either of them. Both of them are a good solution. 
or you could buy both, and that would be the fastest way to dispense of your um, fuel surplus that you have. And, um, you know, there's a first world problem here, but some people do have this problem. You got too much fuel, you need something to burn through it fast. You gotta, you're not doing it right if you're not spending 200 bucks every refill. And uh, these, these off-roaders, I mean, these are the way to do it. And if you, especially if you buy two of them, you toss the keys to one of your buddies and you both go rip it in the desert and you have fun. And then partway through, you trade trucks and you rip it in the, the other truck too. I mean, that's what you do. That, that's truly what the, uh, I think that's what the rich should be doing. Uh, instead, they buy, you know, Gucci handbags and sunglasses and expensive watches and fancy yachts. If it were my money, this is, you know how I would spend it. It would be on like 150 240s, but, uh, <laughs> or you could spend it on a few of these. So anyway, really cool stuff. Again, if that's you, if you need to spend all of that fuel, if you need to burn it all, and if you need something uniquely capable of doing it, both trucks are going to be your, a good option, but your best option is going to be buy both of them. And I don't think you will be disappointed in any way, shape, or form. So there you go. Now, hey, on the way, the next segment of the show, we're talking about Tesla. They're up to their usual funny business. And it's not really that funny, but I'll tell you about it. That's coming up right here after the break. At the Speed Council, we understand that to go fast, you sometimes need to spend fast. As the inventor of hypersonic travel, the world's fastest cat, and instant noodles, we know what it takes. Money. Your contributions, bribes, and other monetary gifts keep the lights on at the Speed Council. However, we also know that giving back to our supporters is important, and now through the month of November, if you have contributed to the cause of speed, you're eligible to receive the Automotive ADHD keychain free of charge. New supporters who join through the end of November are also eligible. When you support the Speed Council, you also receive your favorite podcasts early, or as one might say, faster. For more information, visit thespeedcouncil.org. Because if there's anything we're fast at, it's spending money. All right, that was Weston and his supercharge speaking of fast Fords. That was his fast 5-liter, 5.0 Coyote Mustang on the dyno, making over 700 horsepower. That, again, is another car sound from the vault. Weston was a previous winner on a previous month's car sound giveaway, and uh, that car sound, just fantastic, and I felt there was uh, nothing better to go with talking about fast Fords uh, and fast Ford pickups than also a uh, fast V8 Ford Mustang. That works pretty well. Sounds awesome. Sounds crazy on the dyno. Remember, you can send those car sounds in. Not only can you, but you should send those car sounds in. Get them featured right here on the show. You know how it works. It's a lot of fun. I like playing them here. I might just be on a quest on playing everybody's car sounds. So help me help me get to the end of that quest. I don't know if there will ever be an end, but help me along that journey to get them here on the radio show. When you think about it, it's a great way it really is a fantastic way for me to interact with you and then get you on the show, uh, especially on the podcast, because on the radio, you can take callers, you can do stuff. If you're live streaming, you can take comments live, but what can you do on a podcast, right? It's a little harder. So this is a great way for me to get you on the show, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Facebook.com slash automotive ADHD. Check it out. Now, Tesla. Got to talk about Tesla. They're up to their um, their usual funny business of I don't know, thinking they own other people's cars. That may be what they are doing. Um, and uh, this comes down to an issue with a certain gentleman who had a Tesla Model Y, which is rated for a 3,500 pound towing capacity. Uh, and that's with the factory tow package. Now, he was not able to get the factory tow package because of the chip shortage. It was unavailable when he bought his car. So he said, that's okay. I'll pass on it. I'll just do an aftermarket solution, which is just fine. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, factory tow packages involve a lot. It's not just a hitch and a receiver. Um, it can be, you know, anything from a uh, different final drive uh, rear gear ratio. It can be a, a better trans cooler, a uh, bigger radiator. There's a number of things that constitute as towing packages for certain cars. Uh, for the Tesla, 
it's not so much a drivetrain thing as it is putting the hitch on and then getting the wiring and getting it set up so the Tesla will communicate with the trailer and do all stuff and do the lights and do all of that stuff. Um, as, as the cars go, uh, your, your towing capacity in that regard is really limited by your suspension and um, things like that. The suspension, the structure of the car. Uh, the Teslas have more than enough power. That's a, the power is a non-issue. Now, the range might be an issue, but the immediate torque is, is um, if anything, really good for towing. Um, but he decided he was going to get an aftermarket solution, which is not necessarily any worse. In fact, the aftermarket solution he got was rated for plenty of weight designed for the Tesla designed to do exactly what he needed in a safe way. Tesla though, uh, turns out that in order to tow correctly and get everything working right, he still needed Tesla's proprietary towing software. He had to have that unlocked on the car and the problem was when he went to Tesla, they said, no, you can't have it. We won't let you have it because you didn't buy our official towing package. And he goes, well, I couldn't buy it. And they say, too bad. Um, we won't allow our towing software to be used on anything other than our package because of liability reasons, which at face value seems like, a oh, liability. That makes sense. But no, not really, because anytime you buy a car and you put an aftermarket, you know, towing system on it, a receiver and the wiring and stuff. If something happens for one, that is say, if the car is not designed for that, you void your warranty. If the car is designed for towing and you just had to put the receiver on and then something happens and there's a incident, a mishap with the trailer, the manufacturer isn't liable. The manufacturer in a court of law is a lawyer is going to say that was an aftermarket system. Therefore, and it was not installed by the dealer. Therefore, the manufacturer is not liable for this. So Tesla saying that they're worried about liability with their software and the aftermarket product doesn't make any sense. That's just purely a fabrication. In my opinion, that's a fabrication. That's just not true um, because they wouldn't be on the hook anyway, regardless. Um, if anything, them having their proprietary system and if something wrong happened with their proprietary system, then they would be liable. So you think actually they would prefer the aftermarket one because then they're absolved of any liability from it. But, I, you know, I guess not. I guess not. That's not how they look at it. So, um, but the issue here is it is something, and we talk, I've talked about this when it comes to automotive subscription services. I've talked about that before where it's not, you know, the car is physically capable of doing something, but it's blocked. It is locked out from doing that purely because of software. And I think the resounding opinion of car owners across uh, the world is that the subscription services are a bad idea. Why would you pay for the physical option to have something, say heated seats, and not ha have access to it because of software? And well, if you want it, you got to pay to unlock the software. Well, yeah, but you own the car, right? Like you own it, your name's on the title, then you physically own it, you physically own the hardware to use it, then you should just be able to use it. Uh, if you're not going to have an option, then don't physically have it on there. That's just how that has to make sense, in my opinion. And I think um, I think most owners would agree with me on that. I think most people would. Um, and uh, the whole subscription service thing is nuts. The state of New Jersey, by the way, is seeking to uh, ban that, uh, which is a rare, sensible decision from the state of New Jersey. They're actually seeking to ban subscription services and make it so manufacturers have to allow hard the use of hardware that's already installed on the vehicle, that's already available there, that you can't block it out with software. Now, how does that relate to the towing package and stuff? I don't know how that would re would relate legally, but I would say that's a physical thing. Tesla should at least be, allow or be able to sell you the software. What makes this even muddier and weirder is a number of Tesla owners have chimed in on this situation, saying that they installed a similar aftermarket tow package and Tesla sold them the unlock for the software. Now, bear in mind, there shouldn't be any unlock for the software. It should just it should just work. That's like the whole point. But no, but the fact is Tesla actually did sell them the unlock for the software to for the car to know it's towing and manage the trailer and do all the lights and all that nonsense. So um, they actually did. And some people said that there was one one user on one of the Tesla forms that even mentioned that their friend got a aftermarket towing system installed and then the dealer unlocked the towing software for him. And then that this person installed the same system and the dealer wouldn't do it for him. So why for that guy, but not for me, right? I think there's some inconsistency in Tesla's internal policy in regard to handling this. Um, and the, the thing is, there shouldn't be any policy in handling this. They should just sell it to you. And that should just be the end of the story. 
Uh, Tesla is famous. They are famous, or rather infamous, I should say, for um, you know not allowing users or owners of cars to do their own repairs. And if you do your own repair, or if you have a non-Tesla certified shop do the repair, that they're going to blacklist you from their service centers. The car is going to know through the network that, that, that this repair has been done illegitimately. You know, the system's going to know that it's, it's on the naughty list now. Then you can't supercharge it at the superchargers. All of that stuff is ridiculous. And I think turns owners off from the uh, potential ownership of a Tesla. I know several people, in fact, one listener of this show, who is a Tesla owner and loves their Tesla dearly, and that's great. Uh, they even sent a car sound into the show as well, which sounded a little bit um, sounded a little bit like this. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But anyway, um, but uh, that said, you know, a lot of people love the cars. I, I respect that they're fast. I respect that they're comfy and quiet, you know, and that's something that people want. Some people want that in their cars. And that they are truly fast. They're, they're, they're rocket ship fast. I won't argue that point. But if you're not treating your customers well, if you're Tesla and you're not treating them well, more people are going to turn to other options. Tesla has been the only kid on the block for years. They have been the only kid on the block. They've been the only ones with these cars that are you know made this way. But that's different now. Uh, you've got other competitors. You've got Rivian. You've got Lucid Air. Problem with these competitors is they are going through all the teething issues in terms of early production and quality control that Tesla had to deal with when they were a newer company. Tesla's a little more rooted now. They've got some systems in place that work. Um, but the problem is the competitors are no longer just these small startups. You know, Tesla hasn't really had to worry about the small startups. The problem is the competition now for electric vehicles is coming from Ford, GM, soon to be Chrysler as well, uh, Dodge and all of that. And that's the issue because those guys, Ford have, has been making cars for a hundred years, if not more. They know how to make cars. They know how to make them efficiently. They know how to do supply chains. They know how to do all of this stuff. And when they make some more competitive models, not just the F-150 Lightning and the, you know, Ford, don't call it a Mustang Mach-E, you know, if they start making some more other competitive models and they make them cheaper and they make them better, and they don't have the crazy sense of control that Tesla has over its products, um, I think more owners are just going to turn to that. They're just going to do it. I mean, Tesla's fine now because, yeah, they're really the only competitor. But that's not going to last for forever, and they got to start treating customers better and also recognizing the right to repair. And this should be a lesson for Ford and GM and the other big manufacturers who might be looking at Tesla for things to emulate. They should not emulate Tesla's policies on right to repair by any means. They shouldn't. And they could do it, but they shouldn't do it. And they better not. And I think they won't because they know that that is one thing that drives people away from Teslas. Um, you know, Rich Rebuilds is a uh, prominent YouTuber who's famous for doing stuff to Teslas that Tesla doesn't like, but he does it anyway. And you know what? At the end of the day, if it's legal to do it and you own the car, Tesla can't stop you from doing it. Um, there was a Tesla Model uh, S owner uh, recently I talked about on the show who had a larger capacity battery pack installed uh, years ago because a the battery pack that was supposed to be for their specific car wasn't available. So the Tesla service center, this was an official Tesla repair, installed the bigger capacity battery pack because that was what was available. Um, and then so this owner got to enjoy having the bigger battery pack. Well, one day, years later, out of the blue, someone at Tesla notices, hey, that car didn't, they didn't pay for the battery pack upgrade in the software. So we're going to software limit them to the smaller battery pack, even though physically the battery pack is bigger. Well, you can't do that. And the Tesla fans came from the woodworks to defend Tesla saying, well, that guy didn't buy the upgrade for the bigger battery pack software wise. So he gets what he deserves. He's just been having a free ride. Um, you know, and he's, he should have enjoyed it while he had it. That's not true. Cause you know what? He owns the car. Does Tesla own the car under the tight on the title under the ownership section of the title? Does it say Tesla motor corporation? It doesn't. And that's, that's at the end of the day, what I think these companies have to realize is yes, these cars are growing and becoming more connected in these networks. Tesla has a network. All the cars are connected that all communicates with the network. They can do anything, update anything, do whatever. Um, and with that power comes the moral responsibility of not being terrible with it. 
and understanding that people own these cars. Tesla doesn't own the car. Again, if it's legal for you to modify it and legal for you to change something, you can do it if you want. Yeah, it might void your warranty. I understand that argument. But actually blacklisting you from using services and other things because you wanted to modify your Tesla or you wanted to make a repair in an aftermarket sense because, say, the OEM part wasn't available. Uh, or in the case of this tow hitch, this tow system where the OEM one was not available, you couldn't get it even if you had the money for it. So an aftermarket solution was the only option. That shouldn't be a problem. And uh, Tesla should really shape up on that. Maybe learn from other manufacturers, you know, people who've been doing it for for a while. And um, and also Ford and GM shouldn't get any bad ideas from Tesla. We don't need any more of that. Um, the, you know, subscription services and stuff. We all saw what happened to Toyota the second they mentioned, yeah, if you want to keep using your key fob and remote start, you got to have a subscription. Nope. People, I mean, people let Toyota know how they felt. And at least Toyota listened to their audience. So anyway, hey, there you go. This has been a fun edition of the show. Again, a reminder that next week is going to be a really cool interview. Going to talk about mental health, going to talk about cars, how it all connects. It's really good. I'm excited to have my guest on the show. Uh, also, remember, if you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this show uh, wherever you get podcasts, wherever fine shows. And, you know, this one are downloaded um, and subscribing and rating the show is seriously a big help. If you haven't done it, you listen to the show regularly. Make sure you do, because that helps the algorithms. That helps the show move up in the rankings and get distributed more. And uh, that is one thing you can do to help. And it is greatly appreciated. Also, check out the Patreon where you can get early access to the show and some other exclusive stuff. Check it out. Uh, Patreon.com slash Throttle Warrior. Or you can go to the new website, thespeedcouncil.org. Yes, I actually have the domain for that. Uh, and it works and it takes you there, thespeedcouncil.org. So uh, that's uh, all good stuff. Now, hey, I will see you right here, same time, same place next week. It's going to be a good show. And thank you for listening. That's all on the way. And I will see you then. <laughs>